Let us bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for bringing us to this place of worship. Lord, this day is a gift that each one of us has. We can take this day to be upset at things that are going on in our lives. We can take this day to argue. We can take this day to feel sorry for ourselves. We can do anything we want. You give us time and we can do anything we want with it, Lord. But Lord, help us to understand that this day is a gift from you to glorify you so that we may be able to just put everything aside and just thank you for giving us life today and just thank you for giving us the opportunity to be in touch with you and the opportunity to love you and thank you for loving us just as we are just as we are Lord bless us today as we study your word as we Lord uh, try to to center our lives where you want them to be centered where we can have the right vision in our lives in our personal lives and in the church Lord, there's nothing that I can do here today without your Holy Spirit. The preaching of the word without your spirit is just words that go in the air. I ask for your Holy Spirit to be here and to fill every need and to see what everyone here is going through, Lord, and speak to them today. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. A while back, uh, and while we, when we lived in Philadelphia, my wife and I lived in, we went back after I was raised, we went back, and I worked there for a while uh, as a pastor. And uh, my wife was working for a family. And as she did, this was a, a Jewish family. And I remember the man was, uh, he was a psychologist. And uh, this was many, many years ago. Uh, this is probably around, uh, um, 89, 88, 89. And I was talking with him outside of his house and we were talking about religion and he was talking about, you know, him being a Jew and, 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 uh, you know, being of the Jewish religion. And he went to the synagogue every, every Sabbath and all these things. And we talked about it. So I asked him a question. I said, I said, so what do you think of the Messiah? Are you still waiting for the Messiah to come? He said, well, I personally don't think of the Messiah that way anymore. I literally, I really do not think that a personal Messiah is going to come. I think that the Messiah really comes to me every day as I live my life. As I was listening to him, I said, I said, could it be that we as Christians today think of the second coming of Jesus in the same way? Have we lost touch? And I really looked at that. I said, I said, and I asked myself this week as I was thinking about it. I said, when was the last time that I preached about the second coming of Jesus? And I said, you know, I haven't preached specifically about the second coming of Jesus for a long time because we preach a lot about how to make this world better. We preach a lot on how to make church better, how we need to become better loving with one another, how we need to have a nice church, how we need to, you know, oh, oh but, but by the way, we passed the, the, the electrical inspection this week. So. <laughs> Random. I'm random today. I'm, I'm all over the place. 
The guy came in, the inspector, I gave him the plans. I said, I said, listen, dude. Here are the plans. Here's the paper. You go around and inspect. I'm going to kneel down in that corner and start praying to God. <laughs> he may work in your heart and pass us. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we passed. We're moving on to other things. Anyway, where was I? So, you know, yeah, okay. We, 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 we put all this emphasis on all these things, and it's almost like, it sounds more like we're trying to make this place a better place to spend eternity in and losing the idea that one day Jesus is going to come and that we're actually going to go to heaven. It's like everything that we do, all of a sudden we've lost that, that idea. Listen, this world is going to end. What are you dedicating your time to? What is it that you're doing? Jesus is coming again. Yes. Yes. Well, well, when, when you look at the disciples, you know, what motivated the disciples and the apostle Paul to preach the gospel with power and authority without even caring about their lives? They didn't care about their lives because, see, when the, when the disciples were here and Jesus said, I am coming back, they really understood that Jesus was coming back while they were going to be alive. And, and they were like, hey, let's do this. When he said, go preach this gospel, he said, come on, let's get it done. Did you, have you reached there? Have you reached there? Have you done this? Have you done that? Because that was the only thing that they were focused on. All they cared about was seeing their Jesus again. Their constant push was to complete the mission of preaching of the gospel. And I think that somehow Christianity today has lost, we've lost all our mission we've lost our mission we've made ourselves the mission we've made our churches the mission we've made our buildings the mission we've made our programs the mission we've made our ministries the mission we've made all these things the mission we've made ourselves the mission me my children people if we put the same emphasis for our children to study the word of God, as much as we get them to study math, our children could be closer to God. If we put as much emphasis on our children having eternal life as we do on them getting a degree, I think us as a family and our children will be better off. You see, Jesus didn't tell them build temples or create great atmosphere in the church or have a great sound system. He told them, go tell them that I'm coming back. Preach the gospel to them. And that's all they understood. Go unto all the world and preach. When they preached the gospel, they, may, they preached the gospel, they met under a tree. They would meet in a house. They will meet anywhere because none of that, the place was not the emphasis. How they did it, if they had the right music, or if they had the right pastor preaching. No, the, the, the preacher was the guy from down the street who knew how to read. And nobody said, well, I ain't going today because, I mean, that dude is boring. The important thing was the content that was giving, the message that was giving, that salvation was there, but they ate it up. Because this, this, this to them wasn't something to entertain them. It was every word was important so that they could be ready when Jesus came back. Amen. That was their emphasis. What else can I do? I want you to know that the information they received was very little. It wasn't a lot of information. Most of them couldn't read. So every single word, I mean, when they received a letter from Paul, they would read it a hundred times and go over it. What does he mean by this? What is he saying by that? Because there was, the, 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 there was a sincere interest in getting ready 
for the coming of Jesus because Jesus told them, I am coming back. Through the years, the vision has changed. Now we, we read our church visions. Have you guys ever sat down? You know, I, because I'm a pastor, I guess, I reach down and I read church's visions. And the church's visions are, in, in a lot of times when you read them, they talk a lot about reaching the community and, and being part of the community and doing this. And I, and I realized, in fact, I went on online and tried to read some of the, the you know, different church's visions. And very rarely did I find to get ready for the second coming of Jesus. Very rarely. To get ready for the second coming of Jesus. Without us understanding that people, if what we're doing is not to get ready for the second coming of Jesus, we're wasting our time. When I preach, it should be to get you ready for the second coming of Jesus. When we sing, it should be to get you ready for the second coming of Jesus. When we do a social here or a picnic, it should be to get people ready for the second coming of Jesus. And everything that we do, because that is why we're here and that is the purpose of the church. And we have to catch ourselves when we begin to be deviated into, into other things and putting too much importance in other things. The disciples had a clear vision and all they wanted to do was to see Jesus again. All they wanted was to fulfill their calling so, so, uh, so they could spend time with Jesus again. A while back, my, my, my wife and I, we went to, to visit um, my, my daughter and her kids. You know, they moved to Arizona and we were, we were on the plane and we were like, we can't wait till we get there. And we were, you know, hey, watch, watch Robert, man, Robert's going to jump, <laughs> he's going to jump right on us. And, 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 and Lyndon, you know, he's going to act this way. He's going to, what, what actually gets, gets us to be so anxious, so desirable to see him is, is the love that we have for them because we took time here with them. Robert was at my house daily. You know, he spent time with us. You know, Lyndon uh, spent a lot of time with my wife. And, and that relationship daily gave us the desire to want to see them again. But you see, when we don't spend that time with Jesus, why would you want to see him? What's the big deal? Sitting on a cloud? I mean, for how long can you ride a lion? You know? Is that heaven? You know? For most people, heaven is... Hey, man, I hope, you know, I owe the bank 100000 I hope Jesus comes now. <laughs> no more bills. Heaven is Jesus. Heaven is Jesus. The most exciting thing about heaven should be when you, oh, my God, you imagine when you see him face to face. And he looks at you like if you've known him forever. Huh? People, that's Christianity. That is the vision of Christianity. This is why we do what we do. This is why we preach. This is why we sing. This is why we building this thing for this is to fill this place up so that we can get people ready for the second coming of Jesus yeah. it's not about oh going to church you know I've told you already going to church is overrated it's not about going to church it's about being the church not everybody that goes to church is the church let me tell you that 
It's not about going to church. It's about being the church. See, the disciples, they had a prior experience. They had been with Jesus daily. And one of their issues was that they, they messed up. You know, they, they didn't use their time. If they, you know, once Jesus went to heaven and they really knew that they were with the Messiah and they realized everything, they, they were probably like kicking themselves. I can't believe this. We had them right here and all we did was fight about who was going to be the greatest. I can't believe we talked all this junk and we did all these things and we were over here into our own little world. The Messiah was right here with us. God was right here with us. I wish I would have asked them this, you know. And the thing is that they were so into, they, they couldn't wait till they see him again to throw himself at his feet and first of all say, Jesus, I am so sorry. You know, Peter probably said, I, I, I talk so much, <laughs> And, and, you know, and John and James are probably going, you know, why do we get upset and mad about these things, God? You have everything under control. This is bigger than all of us. They just wanted to see him again. They just wanted to see him again. You get a little bit of that, or what that is. You know, all of us here who have lost, you know, your mother or your father. And, um, you know, I've lost, you know, my parents recently. And, and uh, the other day I was talking to somebody about it who just lost their, their parent. And I told them, it's going to hit you six months later when you realize that they didn't go on a vacation. No, they're not coming back. They're not. You're really, the only hope is the second coming of Jesus. You realize that. And that's when you start thinking, if I could just see him one more time. One more time. And that's what the disciples were feeling. That's why they didn't care if they were whipped. They didn't care if they were put in prison. They didn't care if they died. So what? He's coming tomorrow. <laughs> so what? Because their only goal, their only desire, the only mission was to be able to see Jesus again. What is driving you and I, people? When we wake up in the morning, what is driving us? What's driving us? A new deal? A new property? A test? My boss to try to win him over? More money? What is driving us every day? For a Christian, one of the first things that, that should happen to a Christian is that our world view should change. What, what's important changes. What should happen to a Christian is that our priorities change. We don't think like the world. The priorities of the world are not our priorities anymore. When we look at our children, though it's important for our children to be successful and to go to school, the priority is not that. The priority is how can I get this little kid to heaven? What do I need to do to get him there? Yet we save money, we do this, we go into all these plans, whatever, so we can get them to college. And we, and we stay up with them all night doing their homework, and we do these things. You know, as, as parents, you know, how many of us, you know, got into those little science projects, you know? 
those posters, putting those posters together and sticking stuff on them, you know, and there to, 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 we don't know, to all late at night working on that stuff. How, when was the last time we stayed late up at night, you know, digging into a Bible verse or a Bible story with him? Making sure that they really understand the meaning of that story. Making sure that they understand these things. One of the first things that should happen to a Christian is that we change our world view. Our neighbor is not our neighbor anymore. Our neighbor becomes a candidate for the kingdom of heaven. That I must win over one way or another. I must work my way into them to tell them about Jesus. He's not just the neighbor anymore. You realize that God has put you there with a responsibility. It could be your co-worker. It could be now when you go to eat somewhere. You're going to see, that's the way you see people. When you sit on a plane, no matter where you are, because you have this knowledge that a lot of people don't have, that Jesus is coming again. That actually judgment will come over this world. That you actually believe that your neighbor will be burned up and lost if they do not repent and give their life to Jesus. We've lost that. And we don't realize that there are not five different paths to heaven. Either people are going to be completely lost and destroyed or they're going to be saved. There is no middle ground. Our kids will either be burned and destroyed or they're going to be in heaven with us. And yet, if one of our children gets sick, gets a cold, or has a, a, a difficult, we're running to the hospitals and we're doing all these kinds of things to give them more life in this world. But they are dying spiritually and we're not doing anything. How does that happen? Because we lose the sensitivity to the mission and we lose the sensitivity to the second coming of Jesus. We lose it. The second coming of Jesus, just like to that Jewish person I talked about at the beginning, is a philosophy, it's an idea. It's something we talk about. Have you ever really sat down and thought, I mean, are really like millions and millions and millions of angels going to come out of the sky, really? Is, I mean, is Jesus going to be like floating in the middle and coming down? Come on, you know you thought about it, you just don't want to say it. I mean, is that really, really going to happen? You know, when doubt comes into that, it's because you haven't been in the word of God and you haven't seen all the miracles of the past already. But when you're in his word and you've seen the way he's done in the past and everything that he's done and everything that he's done has been fulfilled. Hey, if somebody, if I tell you 10 things and out of those 10 things, nine have happened, I'm pretty sure you're going to believe that 10th one. But if you've been out of touch with God, I mean, you just got to think the first coming took 4,000 years. <laughs> but history has proven that he showed up. <laughs> and he died on the cross. It's not a theory. It's, a, it's historically correct. And that he was going to die and he was going to resurrect. And it's proven. So when you see that, and then he says in John 14, 1 and 6, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart, you're tr troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. 
In my father's house are many mansions. And I like this, if it were not so, I would have told you. I love that part of the verse. To me, that is my favorite part of the verse. In other words, he's saying, I ain't lying. <laughs> if it were not so, I don't make up stories. It's not a philosophy. If it were not so, I would have told you. That is a big part of that verse. Amen. It is not a story. It is not something I'm making up. This is for real. In my father's house, a man and said, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come what? I will come again. You see, you need to understand that if you don't believe that as real, then take the whole Bible, throw it away. Because these are words not of Paul, not of Matthew. These are words of Jesus. So if that is not real, I mean, as real as that chair right there. If it's not real for you, then you must stop coming to church and stop playing this game. You either one day have to get on your knees and say, God, I want to understand the reality of your existence. I want everything or nothing. Because this playing around is making you insensitive. It's not making you better. It's making you worse. It's making you worse. And if I go and prepare a place for I will come again. And I will receive you unto myself. <laughs> that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, and where I go, you know. And the way, you know. And the way you know, and you can't leave this verse. You got to finish the other words because you got to know what the way is. <laughs> Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? Oh, that famous verse. Jesus said, for I am the way and the truth and the life. No one, no one, no one comes to the Father. Unless it is through me. So what is. You say. Well pastor. I guess I do want to go to heaven. Get to know Jesus. Amen. Study him every day. Love him every day. Talk to him every day. Build that relationship with Jesus. What does the Bible say about you? I want to know everything about you Jesus. I want to love you every day. I want to get to know who you are. I want to know how you think. I want to get to know you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. He said, I am not leaving you alone. I am leaving the Holy Spirit with you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. In fact, do you know that the devil knows that Jesus is coming back soon? <laughs> Revelations 12, 2 said, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has a short time. He's more worried than you and I are. <laughs> he knows he has a short time. See, he understands that the fight is fixed. You know, you've heard me say that phrase a lot of times. It is a fixed fight. He's fighting a fight that he knows is fixed. So his purpose right now, do you know that the devil is not interested in winning? He knows he can't beat God. And he knows it's already done. His purpose is not in winning. His purpose is in losing with you and I next to him. That's his purpose. 
I'm going to take down as many as I can with me. Yes, Jesus, those people that you love, I'm going to try to, I'm gonna tr that's why I'm going to get to you. I'm going to get to you by taking this and this and this and these people down with me. That's how I'm going to get to you. And he knows that that will get to Jesus. That will get to Jesus. Sometimes we, we look at what, how long this has taken. 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9. Peter straightens us out on that. 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9. It says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to what? Repentance. We as Christians, we need to create a balance between wanting Jesus to come quickly and loving our neighbor. Here it says that Jesus says, yes, I can come now. But I am not coming yet because I want you, I want to give you time to change. And sometimes we want Jesus to come really very quickly because we're going through some trouble right now. Now, if we win the lottery, then he could take a little while longer. But we usually want him to come really quickly when we're going through some hassles without thinking of the person who hasn't repented yet. Our love needs to be to our neighbor, to people who need Jesus, because we know that if we die right now, we're still going to be saved. A lot of times I use this example. I told people, I said, listen, if Jesus came down and he told you what, you know what, you're going to go to heaven. Guaranteed. One way or another, you're going to heaven. But let me tell you what, you can either go to heaven with me right now. Let's go. Or I'll give you $10 million. And I'll give you five more years in this earth. After the five years, you're going to heaven anyway. But I give you $10 million right now to enjoy for five years. What do you want to do? Want to take off up there with me right now? Or you want, hey, I'm going to get myself three Ferraris. <laughs> So my house on the beach. I mean, I'm going to go to heaven anyway, but I, you know, let me enjoy those things first. You know, people, and I, sometimes a question like that lets us know where we are. Where we are. Because we think that these little things in our life, today in this world, are life, and they're not. And they're not. That's just like... You know, you guys know I have a couple, a couple little puppies, and and we and we take, you know, and I take that, you know, those cans of meat in them, you know, and uh, liver, you know, they put liver in there, and they put like smushed up chicken in there, all the, you know, and I give it to them. Hey, the minute I'm making that food, boy, their tails are going all over the place, they're like going crazy over that and I'm looking at them th thinking if you only tasted a good plate of rice and beans one day <laughs> if you only knew what lasagna tastes like <laughs> if you only knew what these things taste like but they see that the stuff that I wouldn't even touch and they go crazy over it. And I think that God looks at us sometimes and he sees what we wag our little tails for. Yes. And he's saying, oh, if you only knew what I have for you. If you only knew what I have for you. But yet all these little things in this world are making you wag your tail. For what? It's because you don't know. You don't know. 
In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 says, But I know I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. Concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. This is the, listen, when one of our loved ones pass away, Jesus says, hey, it's okay to suffer. It's okay to cry. It's amazing. It's okay to miss them. But not like those who have no hope. Not like those who have no hope because we believe that Jesus will come again and resurrect our loved ones who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Do you see Paul including himself here? Do you see that he really thought he was going to be alive when Jesus came? He's talking about we. We that are alive are not going to go to heaven before those who have passed away. He's including himself in that group is going to be alive. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, who are alive, we who are alive, and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. You see, but that idea of Paul saying, we who are alive, gave him that belief every single day that he believed that Jesus was coming soon. Amen. And we as Christians, if we want to live in the spirit that God wants us to live in, we must also believe that way that Jesus is coming today that Jesus is coming tomorrow that Jesus is coming soon that you know people and I didn't want to go into it because this sermon with that time would not allow me into the signs and prophecies and the things that are being fulfilled that lets us know that Jesus is coming soon I mean and, and we look around us people and you know where how far are we going to go where else are we going to go and we see how everything is getting set up for God to say, I'm done. You know, like the, the statue of, of Daniel. And in the days of those king, that rock comes and tears it down. The days of those king, we are in the days of those king. We are in that time. We are in that time. Jesus, really really, really is coming. He really is coming. The Bible tells us that Jesus is going to come and take those who have believed in him who were asleep, he will resurrect, and those who are alive, he's going to take them to heaven. And the, and the book of Revelation goes that we're going to be in heaven a thousand years. And after a thousand years, the Bible tells us that New Jerusalem is going to descend from heaven. And come down to this earth. And as it gets down to this earth. Jesus will resurrect. All those who did not believe. And Satan. I have sat down to think this a lot. What if. You and I were to resurrect but find ourselves outside of the city. And as you look over next to you, you're on Satan's side. And you see the great city where you heard since childhood where you had so many opportunities to be in that city. And it says that in the Bible that Jesus will rise above the city. 
And that's where it says that every being will bow before him. And even the devil, when he sees Jesus rise above the city, will have no choice but to fall on the floor. But where were you and I are going to be falling on the floor? Inside the city or outside the city? What a sad day that will be for many. What many chances, many opportunities. But somewhere down the line, they lost the vision. They lost it. And find yourself there with no more opportunities. No, there, is, there isn't going to be another church service next week. There isn't going to be another sermon. There isn't going to be another Bible study. That's it. You will consciously know the decision that you made. But how great it will be for those inside the city. As they know that they are there with their Savior. What a great day that will be. When you and I will just walk in. And Jesus will be waiting for us. And you know there's going to be nobody saying hey we made it. No there's going to be saying Jesus how did you do it? How'd you get me here? There isn't going to be any, hey man, you and I, you know, we pulled it together. We're going to be like, how did you get me here? Sometimes I think about, our, you know, feeling that touch of his face, a mind or that, but that hug, you know? Maybe the smell just the, the feeling. What a great day it's going to be. And people, this is not a theory. This is real. How he's going to do it, how, whatever, don't let your little, you, you know, your little bean brain try to make that happen. He's made everything possible happen up to now. He's going to make that too. Believe. Believe. And every morning we must believe that that is real. And every morning we must know that we're going to be part of that. Every morning. Every morning. And we must live our day knowing that that is real. That that is real. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your blessings. We thank you so much for giving us your promises, for giving us your, your gifts, your word. I mean, you've done everything possible for us to get ready for your second coming. Help us, Lord, to open our eyes and help us to realize, Lord, how how powerful you are and how true you are. That your word is true. It's true. And that we can live it out and that we must live it out each and every day. We ask, Lord, for all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.